We have several classes for you, and you can sign up on cc.guide as well. I'm excited about this morning as we kick off our brand new series with our lead pastor, Pastor Matt, Jesus the Radical. Thanks, Jim. So glad that you're here with us today. Um, let me do a few housekeeping things real quick. Um, during this whole season of COVID, leading and pastoring has been like driving blind. And so uh, we haven't been able to really guess what things are going to happen and, and where it's going. But what we're seeing over the last few weeks, which is great, is a slow increase in attendance uh, once again. As, as people are getting vaccinated, as numbers of COVID are decreasing, we're seeing a lot of people move online back to in-person, which is fantastic. So let me say this to you real quick. Um, we're going to kind of navigate this week by week. If it's possible, if you get a choice between the 9.30 and 11, and you can choose the 11, we're going to ask for some people to move over to that service. Uh, if you didn't know this, we always ran three services here on Sunday, and we're prepared to do that again. Uh, but we don't want to do that before it's necessary, because I like preaching twice when I don't have to preach three times, right? <laughs> and so uh, if you if you like, hey, you know what, it doesn't matter today, and you can choose the 11, that would be great for us. And as both of those services start to fill up, uh, we want to allow there to be social distancing and things like that. It's a little bit difficult in this room, just the format. Uh, I know our kids moved back into their big room this morning because of our kids have been going up every week. And so we have an overflow area in the lobby for people who want to sit in there and watch the sermon and so that's kind of how we're doing this right now, and then we'll continue to evaluate. And even if you don't want to attend the 11 forever, and you can do it even just up to Easter, that will help us tremendously. So thank you so much uh, for doing that. Again, not all of you. Please don't all of you do that, or, or first service will be empty next week. Matthew chapter 10, if you've got your Bible. We start this Lent journey this last week on Ash Wednesday. Uh, I call Lent a beautiful struggle. It is a beautiful struggle. Uh, and if fasting is not a struggle for you, then you need to tell me your secret, because man, is it a struggle for me. And so some of you are just a few days into to your struggle, and anytime I start a fast, it is horrible. And so some of you are like detoxing off stuff, and you're having caffeine headaches, and like your hands are twitching because you haven't been on Instagram in three days and stuff. And so that's beautiful. Let me just tell you, it's beautiful. And Lent is a time that is a struggle for us because we're giving up something and sacrificing we love. But here's what we're doing. We're, we're setting our hearts toward Christ and saying, we want more of you than anything. And we are willing to walk through the struggle in, in order to experience more of you. And I love that, that Jesus willingly went into the wilderness for 40 days, knowing he was going to be tested, knowing, knowing he was going to be hungry and thirsty, but saying, you know what, I'm going to do it so that I can walk out in the power of the Spirit in relationship with my Father into the ministry he's called me to. And let me tell you, there is... Uh, we, we follow the Christian calendar here at City Church and the rhythms of the Christian calendar, and there is no season more than Lent that deeply shapes us. And it is a struggle, but it's beautiful. And I, and I believe if you'll go on this journey with us at the end of this 40 days, you'll look back and you'll see where God moved in significant ways. But you're going to have to remind yourself on a day-to-day -day basis that sometimes you're not going to see the results. And sometimes you're going to be like, does me missing this lunch really matter? It does. It does. God is doing something inside of you and he's shaping you. During this Lent series, we're launching a new series called Jesus the Radical, and uh, we are going to be dealing with probably the most controversial uh, topics and, and sayings that Jesus ever said, the things that, honestly, that maybe when you read them in the Gospels, you read over them really fast, because you're like, that's uncomfortable. Or maybe they're the ones that get misused or, or abused by people and just say, we're going to take that out of context and we're going to apply it to a situation that we want to apply it to, and a little bit of that is today's uh, text. Maybe it's the text that make you squirm in your seat a little bit. And did Jesus really mean that? Did he say that? Maybe the ones that we push under the rug and we try to hide and act like Jesus didn't really say it. I, I think since you and I weren't living in the first century, obviously, we miss the radical nature of the message of Jesus. There's some things that we just don't realize that, guess what? Jesus rocked the boat everywhere he went. The message of the kingdom of God was so countercultural. It was so subversive. I mean, he's walking into a Jewish culture that says, guess what? Um, you can be in if you are a male, if you're of high status. If you're Jewish, then you can, you can be in, in. And everybody else, there's courts for you. And, and it, it goes on and on. And Jesus is redefining who's in. So he's taking everybody off, right? No, women, you, you're just as much have access to God than anybody else. Gentiles, you can come into. He's redefining who's clean and unclean. Guess what? There's a lot of people that did not like that. A lot. Not only that, but the people he's calling to him. 
are not the who's who. They're not the political influencers. They're not the people with a million Instagram followers. They're nobodies. Like he's gathering a bunch of people on a hillside and preaching a message, and they were afterthoughts. They were people who were on the fringes of society. And then he had the audacity to call to him fishermen and tax collectors and peasants and say, guess what? You're going to be my apprentice, and you're going to take this gospel to the world, and I'm going to use you, not them, not the people with the high IQs, not the influencers, but you. I mean, just the radical nature of what Jesus did on a regular basis. He overthrew power systems by saying, guess what? The first, you're going to be last, and the last will be first. I, I don't know if you've been around Christianity for so long that you've lost the radical, subversive nature of the kingdom of God. But this is what the message did to people. This is what it did. And, and here's what I've learned about people who are radical and people who, who have this kind of subversive message that rocks the boat. They're never appreciated in their time. Did you know that? Many times it's only until later. Like we have a day that we celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. for who he is, what he did. But let me tell you, if you lived during the time of Martin Luther King Jr., did you know there was a lot of people that were like, hey, bro, keep your mouth shut. Stop rocking the boat. You're just adding to the problem. Stop leading these marches. And today we look back and, and the majority of people would honor him for who he is. But in the moment, there was a lot of people who didn't like that. When Jesus ministered everywhere he went people were divided over his message right he rocked the boat i don't know if you're a naturally um a rule follower or rule breaker and anybody in the room like you say i'm a rule follower like if someone tells me to get in line i'm gonna stand in line i'm not gonna try to find another way anybody like i'm a rule breaker uh, here's how you know like when you're coming up to a construction area on in tulsa which is about every half mile and so and one lane is closed, do you get in line with everybody else? Raise your hand. You get in line, like way back there. Come on, those are people after my own heart. Anybody else get in the other lane and you go to the very front and, and cut them off? Yeah, there's a special place for you guys, let me tell you. <laughs> the things that go through my head. My pastor, Rusty Gunn, pastor of Church That Matters, he's one of my best friends, and I, he, he's like, it's called zipper merging, and it's the thing to do. It's actually more efficient. And I said, it could be more efficient, but I still have a special place I want to send you, right? <laughs> I don't care about how efficient it is. Rule follower, rule breaker. And me and my wife, are, are, we're, we're more rule followers by nature. I, I, I think if you were a rule follower, you probably would have struggled being with Jesus on a regular basis. Because again, everywhere that Jesus went, people were divided over his message. And sometimes, again, we miss it because we think that Jesus just preached this message of peace, but it was a, it was a different message of peace. It was, it was this radical, and we'll, and we'll get there in just a minute. And I've learned this, the message of Jesus is still doing that today. It's still radical. It's still subversive. It still uh, calls people uh, to a radical place of discipleship. In Matthew chapter 10, 10 here's what's happening. It's an uncomfortable chapter. And so it's a chapter that if it's in your daily devotional, you're like, I'm going to read this one fast to get to the next one. Because what Jesus is doing is for the first time, he's about to send his disciples out on their first missionary journey without him. Look at the pattern of the life of Jesus. You come and you follow me. And then after a certain amount of time, I turn you back out and I send you. Like that's the discipleship model for Jesus. It's not come sit at my feet and listen to me preach the rest of your life and never do anything. Eventually, in discipleship to Jesus, he's going to call you to go. 2,000 years ago and today. And he sent them in groups of two so they weren't alone. So they wouldn't get discouraged and they'd always have somebody. And here's what we learn about Jesus. Jesus wants his disciples in Matthew 10 to know this. That, that mission and persecution are inseparable. Now, if that doesn't make you feel good, I don't know what will, right? He wants them to know that mission and persecution are inseparable. That's why he's telling them in Matthew 10, and we're not going to read this part. He's like, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Don't fear who, him who could take your life or your body, but fear him who, who could throw you into hell and your soul. Why is Jesus saying all this thing? Because Jesus is preparing them for the reality of what living on mission and obedience may entail. He didn't say, oh, follow me, give me your life, and guess what, man, just everything you've ever desired will happen. It's not what he said. He's preparing them for this reality, and this is what life looks like in the shadow of the cross. 
Lent messages, right? So as we go into season of Lent up to Good Friday and Easter, Lent is sitting in the shadow of the cross. There are no more challenging messages that I will preach all year than I do during Lent because the cross is challenging. There's no other way around it. The cross confronts us with our sin and our idols. The, the cross confronts us what discipleship to Jesus looks like. And so Lent is supposed to be uncomfortable. Welcome to City Church today. It's about to get uncomfortable. And so Jesus gives them a series of uncomfortable statements highlighting what wholehearted allegiance to him and his kingdom would look like. He's about to give them several uncomfortable statements all in a row to show them what discipleship to him really means. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 32, says this. He says, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. So immediately, what is Jesus doing? He's preparing them for the possible reality that they may, may be faced with a decision. He's, he's preparing them for the, the persecution that could come where, hey, guess what? You may have to choose who you're going to follow. And let me tell you, when you're confronted in that moment with what is popular or unpopular, what maybe life or death, maybe social consequences of what others may say, you better take note and know that there are eternal consequences for disowning me. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? There's eternal consequences for you saying, not acknowledging who I am in the moment. And you have to prepare yourself that if you choose to walk in obedience and say yes to me, you may find yourself in a situation just like that. Well, it's about to get even more uncomfortable. Verse 34. Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father and a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemy will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. I don't necessarily have that highlighted in my Bible. I've got to be honest with you. That's not one that I just like, I'm going to stand on that, Right? And it's one that, again, we want to kind of sweep under the rung because even the verbiage, like, oh, wait a minute. This is honestly one of those passages, and we're going to do this a lot in this series, where you have to use really good biblical hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is how we interpret the Bible and what we apply. And if you don't have those, you can make the Bible say something it's not saying to fit your own agenda. And there are a ton of people right now that are using this passage to fit their own agenda. You can't separate one verse from the bigger story of God. You don't base your theology on one verse. You base your theology on the whole of Scripture. So, so what do we learn in, in a passage like this? We learn that what Jesus is doing is what Jesus does all the time. He uses hi hyperbole. He uses exaggerated language in order to uh, tell you what he's trying to do. This is what Jesus is like. Oh, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Like, is Jesus literally saying that it can't? No. He's using hyperbole. He, he's exaggerating statements to show you how difficult it is when money grabs a hold of your heart and to enter the kingdom of God. So Jesus is doing that similarly in this situation. Did Jesus come to bring peace? Yeah, it's okay. The answer is yes. But maybe not the kind of peace that you think, which is what this text is getting us to. Maybe the peace that Jesus is going to bring is different than the peace that you have in your head where everybody just sings kumbaya and holds their hand, right? Maybe Jesus had something greater than he was trying to do in this moment because the peace Jesus would bring would bring strife and division to many. That is the tough reality. The peace that Jesus wants to bring to this world today, the peace that brings salvation, the, pre the peace that brings uh, restoration and redemption to this world, many people will hate you because of it. Many people will turn their back if you choose to stand in the truth of what God says. For many of you, it will drive a wedge between people that you love. There are evil forces and people that are actively opposed to the message of the gospel, the truth of what Jesus claimed. 
And Jesus is addressing that in this situation in an uncomfortable way. In the Jewish culture, if you'd have lived in the first century, one of your greatest social obligations was taking care of your family. Right? The, the Jewish ideal of family was elevated very high. It was God's design. It was a good thing. It was one of the ways that, that God moves through society to redeem and restore things. And it is a good thing. And here's what Jesus is saying. But your allegiance to me supersedes that. So some of you in the room, when you made a decision to come to Christ, guess what? Your family was there when, at your baptism. They celebrated you. They were like, we're for you. Anything we can do to, for you. And some of you in this room... When you came to know Jesus, some of your family looked at you and said, you did what? You did what? How could you be so stupid and naive to follow follow something like that? And you were persecuted because of your decision to follow Christ. And Jesus is saying, some of you in this room will face that. Some of you may have to choose between your family and me. Uh, One of my good friends, Dave, he came and spoke at our staff a few weeks ago. Dave always listens to our message every week. So, Dave, thanks for uh, coming and blessing our staff and feeding us and giving us a bunch of great stuff. He works uh, for Voice of the Martyrs in Bartlesville, and I guess Bartlesville is that way, that point over there. Um, And and Dave just, uh, he's an awesome guy, and he shared a Devo with our staff. And I don't know about you, but I feel a personal obligation as, as a member of the body of Christ, not just this church, but the global church, to know about the persecuted church happening globally, um, what people are doing. And I've tri- traveled all around the world every year. We take trips to, to Kenya and Burundi. Burundi is where our church planning school is. It's the second poorest country in the world. Uh, there's so much persecution in that area of Africa. Uh, we have a ton of Congolese church planners coming into our church planning school right now because of the persecution that's happening there that we can't get into that country Burundi opened to us several years ago. Um, You, City Church, just helped fund a church planning school that just was finished. So now church planners are are being trained up there. And I'll never forget driving through there even just last year. And we stop at one of the churches, and it's Pastor Hermes. And I meet the pastor, and I can't help but look around the room, and there's small little holes all over the ceiling and the walls. And, uh, you know, it's just kind of, it was odd looking. It looked like Swiss cheese everywhere. And Stephen Kurt, you know, he's part of our church as well. They're missionaries. In fact, they just landed in Kenya yesterday. He grabs me and he said, a few years ago, he said, someone tried to kill Pastor Hermes. They threw a grenade in the church in the middle of the service. He goes, several other people died. And Hermes, because of his life, had to leave. His family didn't even know where he was. He ran into the Congo, lived in a refugee camp in, in Congo. Congo is like the Wild West. For two years. I'm sorry, but I don't have to deal with that stuff, right? And, and I'm just sitting there like my jaws on the ground. I'm like, you kidding me? And he's like, no, his family actually thought he was dead. And then two years later, he shows back up here. And I'm looking at this church full of men, women, and children dancing and praising God. And I'm just like, that is my hero, Pastor Hermes. That's my hero. And yet all over the world, every day, there are people that because they've chosen to follow Jesus, they have to give their life. They're thrown in prison for years. Dave, as he was sharing this with us, he was talking about the persecuted church globally, and he just said something that really hit home with me. He said, what I see in the Western world, and especially in America, in the church, is American Christians are very, very high on knowledge. They want as much knowledge as they possibly can get, but they're very low in obedience. They want Christianity their way. They want to take it like a buffet, and we want to pick the pieces that fit our agenda and what we want. And he said, when I go into the persecuted church globally, I meet these people, and they are so low on knowledge. They know almost nothing of the Bible, but they are so high on obedience. And if they're confronted with this option to die or or to, to renounce their faith, guess what? They give up their life, and all they know is that they're loved by God. I don't know about you, but that spoke to me. I read recently in this area of Vietnam, this this pastor, Vietnamese pastor said this. He shared with his church. He says, suffering is not the worst thing that can happen to us. Disobedience to God is the worst thing. We have to be obedient to God. Which brings us to the last two verses that we're going to look at this morning in this feel-good message for you on the first week of Lent. 
Verse 38, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now hear me out here just for a second. Because when I read something like this and and I stop to look around at the situation that we find ourselves culturally right now, specifically in the United States, I, I can't help but think about this. Have we somehow lost the radical nature of what discipleship to Jesus really means? Because this is my opinion, and you can take this or leave it, and I'll tell you all the time, I'm like, this is the pastoral opinion, you're welcome to throw it out. This is not scripture, I'm not quoting anything. See, I think we have a discipleship problem here in our country. I think one of the reasons there's so much division, even in the body of Christ today, so much confusion, is because we don't have a biblical worldview, and we haven't truly been formed into the image of Jesus. So when confronted with certain things, we take stands and hard lines on something as stupid as a face mask. We say this all the time. Romans 14 and 15 is the weak and the strong. We fight for the essentials of our faith. We hold the non-essentials loosely. A cloth you put on your face is a non-essential, which means you give up your rights and your preferences to be a part of the body of Christ. That's how the body of Christ works. That's the only way to keep unity, right? Right? And so we do that. We fight for the essentials, but we hold the non-essentials loosely. That's the only way that we can move forward as the body of Christ and keep the main things the main things, because guess what? We live in a world where every, but everything is the main thing, but it's not, is it? If everything becomes the main thing, then the gospel no longer becomes the main thing. We lose our witness to the world to live on mission for Jesus. Are you with me? So we have to stay focused. We have to stay focused on, no, these are the main things, and these are the things I hold open-handed, palms open, and saying, you know what, I may not prefer it, like who really likes to wear a mask, but I'll do it if I need to. I'll do it for my brother or sister. And I can't help but think that sometimes, especially the church here has failed us. And I'll be the first to apologize and repent on behalf of a church leader that we've been so busy entertaining people, preaching what is popular. We only want to preach sermon series that people will attend. So we don't preach the really hard passages because who wants to come and hear a really hard message? And so we just preach the popular text. We've been so busy marketing, building a celebrity culture of pastors. Hear me on this. And if you've been listening to the news lately, Let me tell you, most pastors are faithful. They love God. They do things the right way. Nobody knows their name. They don't get the headlines. But there's a few, I mean, that are falling by the wayside right now. Abuse, scandal, affairs. Your pastor was never designed to be a celebrity. Can I just say that out loud? If you're following and worshiping me, I'm sorry. That, that doesn't hold. And yet we've built celebrity cultures. We've, we've built cultures and our faith around people instead around our foundation, which is Christ. Leaders and pastors come and go. It doesn't mean you don't trust them or honor them, but I don't put my faith in you. It's not built upon you. You're sinful. You, you'll, you can let me down. Christ will never let me down. Maybe this idea of the American dream See, I I think the cross confronts us with these things. Maybe this idea of the American dream that you have in your head that you're pursuing, like it's this family, it's getting married, it's this job, it's traveling, all of these things. Your idol can be this, this image of the American dream that you're running after instead of running after Christ and his mission. So let me end with this this morning. What does it mean for us to take up our cross and follow Jesus? What does this mean in in verse 38? He says, whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. What does that mean? Well, let me say this. You can't take up Christ's cross. You can't go be the forgiveness of sin. You can't bring the kingdom of God in your own ability. Only God can do those things. 
Here's what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus. It means this. You are ready to face whatever may come your way because of your yes to Jesus. Are you with me? That's what it means to take up your cross. Jesus, whatever may come my way because of my yes to you, I will endure it. I pray to God that you don't have division in your family, but if you do, will you say yes to Jesus? I pray to God that you're not persecuted, but in that moment, will you acknowledge Christ or will you disown him? In that moment where you're faced with living the American dream or following the mission of God, will you choose the mission of God even if it's difficult? That's what it means to pick up your cross. Whatever comes my way, whatever road this leads me down, guess what, Jesus? I choose you. And nothing will will take that. Nothing will take that away. I think the radical nature of the life of Jesus, something that Jesus was so extreme in, two things. Number one, his love for us. His love for us is always more than you could ever imagine. And number two, his call to discipleship. I think at times, we, again, we've lowered the bar of discipleship so low so as many people possibly could step over it. And what Jesus did throughout scripture is raise it to this place that says, no, it's all or nothing. And guess what? People walked away from Jesus and he let them walk away because they chose to be Lord of their own life. And during this Lent season, I I, I think what we have to confront ourselves with is is living in light of the cross. It means that we sacrifice something. It means that we're willing to give our lives away, whatever that may be. That we can't opt out of discipleship to Jesus. We can't opt out of missional living. We can't opt out of loving our neighbor. You can't opt out of it. You can't sit on the fringes of the church and society and the Christian circle and then call yourself a follower of Jesus. No, this is an all-in endeavor and the cross calls us to that. Here's what I want you to do across the room. If you would stand with me. If you would, go ahead and grab your communion elements. I want to end with this question here. I can't help but look at this church in the book of Acts who in a very short time transformed the world with the gospel. But you know what I see in the book of Acts? Wholehearted allegiance to God. You know what Jesus says in John chapter 14? You can't just look at all the things that you're going to have to give up or sacrifice because here's what Jesus says. Guess what? My Holy Spirit will be with you. My Holy Spirit will tell you what to say. My Holy Spirit will give you joy and peace. There is no greater place in your life to be than fully abandoned to the ways of God. Fully on mission for Jesus. Is it difficult at times? You better believe it. I I tell our church planters that we're training right now, we have several churches that we're going to be planting this year, I I tell them, I say, as you begin to prepare, you better better prepare for spiritual warfare and to do battle because the enemy's going to come against you. The enemy's going to attack you because what's at stake is hundreds and thousands of people, generations of families that will come to know Jesus because of your yes. And if you think the enemy is going to set back and do nothing, man, you don't know what's going to hit you. But guess what? God will be with you. God will sustain you. And that's the same for you. This question with here, with this understanding of what it meant to be a follower of Jesus, is it any wonder that the early church turned their world upside down with the gospel? Is it any wonder that this small group of believers transformed the world because they were all in? Man, we don't know what's going to come our way, but we choose to pick up our cross. We follow Jesus, whether it's suffering, whether it's difficulty, whether if it costs us our relationship, whether it's popular or not. Jesus, we choose you. This morning, we're going to prepare to take communion together. We do this every week. We come to the table. I can't wait for the day when all of this 
pandemic is over and we can stop using communion to go and we can come up to the tables again as a community, stop eating whatever this thing is. (laughs) But until that day, we're going to continue to do this. But every week we come to the table together and we remind ourselves who we are. We are not people of this world. We're not citizens of this world. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven who have been bought with a price. And the body and the blood of Jesus define us. And we believe that if we will die with Christ, we'll also live with Christ and be resurrected with him. So if you would, just right now this moment, just close your eyes. And we always have this moment where we allow the Holy Spirit just to speak to our hearts. The greatest teacher is always the Holy Spirit inside of us. Maybe there's some things during this season of Lent as we come to the cross that you just need to put at the foot of the cross. Maybe some idols, some things that you've been holding on to that has kept you from full discipleship to Jesus. Father, during this season of Lent, we corporately repent. We repent of trying to find our own way. We repent of choosing our way over your way. We we repent when we've chosen the easy way instead of the way of the cross. God, we repent when we've opted out of discipleship or missional living or loving people because the price tag was too high. We repent for taking some of you, but not all of you. And Father, we pray this morning that as we pick up our cross, that in that we find life and joy and purpose. As we find all of you, Father. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Remember, Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. took the cup, passed it around. He said, this is my shed blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Drink and do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Amen. Again, let me encourage you. As so many of you are going on this Lent journey, if you're a little bit late to the game, hey, start with us now. Our staff gathers together every Monday. We we want you to know this. If there are specific things that we can be praying for you, um, on cc.guide, you can can click on uh, the contact button, contact us. You can email us at info at citychurchtulsa.com. We want to be praying with you and believing with you. If there are specific prayer requests that you have, please let us know. We will be calling you out by name. All of you who are going on this prayer and fasting journey, we are calling you out by name, believing that God would do an inner transformation in your heart during this season. Do you believe it? Amen? Amen. A couple quick reminders for you. Uh, First time guests, be just outside in the lobby in the welcome area. I'd love for you to stop by and see me just 30 seconds of your time and we have a free gift for you. And then again, if you've never been to dinner with the staff, tomorrow night at 6.30 at our offices, we would love to get the opportunity to know you and and to greet you. And uh, thanks so much for being here. Let's end with our mission statement and go live it out this week. Wherever you are, Be be the gospel.